Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to a, a great conversation today, and we're looking forward to your questions at the end. Uh, I am looking forward to this presentation that I've orchestrated just for you, reinforced exclusively with my own photos, to shed light on how in the heck has America gone crazy? And what, what's happening here? You confused? Uh, so we're gonna spend a little time talking about that. They asked me to give you just a little background as to the mindset that I bring to this. Uh, I am one of seven kids from rural Minnesota up in the northern part of the state, who's also the first boy in my family to go to college, as was mentioned. I later on was, an, after being an accountant for a few years, got my MBA at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, that, after that, I went on and helped Pillsbury by a little ice cream company called haagen and we were selling uh, $500 million in Japan alone five years after we bought it. Then I was treasurer at age 31 of a company you now know as Macy's, uh, one of America's 100 largest companies. But really from my youth, I always wanted to be involved in politics. So after that career in business, I pursued a race for the US Congress. And in that race, the number one driving issue for me is the belief that tying the world closer together, knitting the world closer together through trade, through increased economic interactions, is the best thing we can do for both our economies as well as our security. So my very first campaign event was to take a grain truck around my very rural district and say that I was never gonna use trade as a weapon, that I was gonna to work to open up markets for our farmers, not close them off. When I was in Congress, after I won by a very narrow margin, I had a number of one vote margin votes, but two of them were in trade. So if I had not been in Congress, those trade bills would have not have passed. Trade has always been controversial. And when I voted for the Central American Free Trade Agreement, of course, the media was quick to criticize me. But I take great comfort in the fact that because I was there to do those one vote margin votes, we ended up having expanded trade agreements with 17 different countries. So I think I've already added my little piece to the puzzle of making what I view as a better world. I've been actively engaged in trade with both the Bush and the Obama administrations, a big strong supporter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and very nervous about the current political environment as to whether we can ultimately get that done. Since my time in Congress, I'm in academia, as just mentioned, at the Graduate School of Political Management, the first and foremost school of applied politics. We're pleased to have Makashima Karan-san, a congresswoman in your diet and one of your few female uh, vice ministers that is our graduate. We have other great graduates. Uh, I have a book coming out, which maybe I'll get a chance to come back here next year and tell you about, about how business ought to engage with society. But now I'll be heading to the University of North Dakota as their president and very much looking forward to that. That's me. Let's get back to what's going on in the world. I'm going to cover three things here. The first thing I'm going to cover is the fact that this Make America Great Again message that Trump is putting forth is resonating because America doesn't really feel that great right now. So why doesn't America feel great right now is the first thing we're gonna discuss. The second thing we're gonna discuss is how has Trump appealed to the American people? The art of the deal of getting them to be the Republican nominee, how has that happened? As you may know, I happen to be a Republican. Uh, you, I'm not gonna try to be doing an anti-Trump speech here, but I'm, Given my strong feelings on trade, not a big fan, but hopefully you won't have that coming through here. And then finally, what happens if Trump wins? Let's start with why are we not feeling that great again? The first thing is government dysfunction. As you probably know, Americans take great pride in their government. And when their government isn't working, that's a big source of consternation to them. During my time in Congress from 2001 to 2007, we had consistently 50% approval ratings of Congress, which is about as good as you get since we have a two-party system. The other party, if they're not empowered, you know, generally aren't viewing the Congress that well. 
We spiked up in the 80s, but as you can see, we've had a hard time keeping double digits recently. So the approval of Congress is down reflecting that angst. Why does this happen? The first thing you need to know is that there are some structural parts of our government that make it difficult. Unlike your system, which is more of a parliamentary system, we have a presidential system. So Shinzo Abe, prime minister, can always count on the fact that the majority of the people in your Congress are with his party. That doesn't always happen, and it's not happening today in the US. The other thing we find is that we have a two-party system enforced on us through the Electoral Congress. The way the Electoral Congress does this is that if you don't get a majority of the votes in the Electoral Congress when you're running for president, the vote will then go to the U.S. House, and each state gets one vote in the U.S. House, and there's no state controlled by anybody other than a Republican or a Democrat. So the only way a third party could ever win in president is if they were able to beat both the Democrats and the Republicans, and that will never happen. So you have multiple parties. So the world doesn't easily fit into just two parties. If you have multiple parties, you can piece together a couple into different ways, and you've got multiple ways of achieving uh, action. In a two-party system, it ha it's normally one or the other. We also have a tradition that you may or may not have heard of called the cloture vote, sometimes referred to as a filibuster. The tradition in the Senate is almost everything. You need 60 votes out of 100 to move forward. And normally, to stop the debate and vote. And normally, one party controls 51, 52, 53, maybe 54, maybe 56, but rarely 60. The Republicans have not had both 60 votes in the Senate, the House, and the presidency, which you would need to do to act with just one party. They haven't had that for a century. When the Democrats had that very briefly at the beginning of Obama's term, uh, them passing Obamacare without any Republican votes has resulted in friction and the, that being a centerpiece of the Republican opposition with the promise to reverse it that has proven the wisdom of Thomas Jefferson saying great innovation should, be, should not be forced on a slender majority. So it's very difficult to do it one party, and when it is, it costs lots of consternation. The only way that our system works is if, as the Irish uh, member of the British Parliament said, your representative owes you his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it for your opinion. So the only way our system works if there are members that will individually think about something, not just in party terms, but what they really think is right, and occasionally work with the other party. You have a much stronger party discipline as part of your system. Your system relies on that party system discipline. If we have party discipline, our system grinds, grinds to a halt, and that's basically what it's done. Why has it that used to work? Why is it not working today? The first thing is we've had geo-sorting. Three out of the four people that consistently vote liberal live in the city. Three out of the four people that consistently vote conservative or Republican live in the country. And they rarely see people of the other party. And they're all sitting there chatting about politics and say, everybody we know agrees with us or if you're in the country you, and you're liberal, you keep quiet, or if you're a conservative in the city, you keep quiet. So most people they talk to agree with us. Why can't those crazy people in Washington agree with us? But the other thing is that one, the other side will say, well, it's the other side that's gotten more conservative or more liberal. What this research from Pew Research shows is that over the last several decades, the Republicans have moved to the right, and the Democrats have moved to the left, which this being how many Democrats are really more conservative than the average median Republican or Democrats, there's really very little overlap amongst the electorate today, whereas there used to be a fair piece of overlap just a decade or two ago. Making it even worse in that poll, one out of three 
both Republicans and Democrat view the other side as, quote, they are so misguided that they threaten the nation's well-being. One out of three Democrats think that the Republicans threaten the nation's well-being. One out of three Republicans think the same of Democrats. So it's a very visceral uh, conflict going on. In fact, a different poll showed that one out of five of each party would contemplate moving out of the country if the other side's president won, which prompts the joke of saying that if Trump wins, that Canada is going to build a wall and pay for it themselves to keep all the Americans from moving out. The other thing that's happened is it's not just the people have self-sorted. We have what we call gerrymandering that you may have heard of. Gerrymandering is this idea that if you're in a district that's, in this example, 60% blue, 40% red, depending on how you slice it up in ways that are favorable to you, you can make it anything you want. And that's what's happened. As a result of that, we have 435 seats in the House. In 1992, 103 of those were swing districts, meaning that they would, from time to time, flip back and forth from being a Republican district to a Democrat district. Because of all this gerrymandering, we only have 35 swing districts in 2012. It's, it's largely the same today meaning less than one out of 10 members of the House are most worried about the general election. They're more worried about their primary. So they're more worried about if they're a Democrat, another Democrat running against them because they're not liberal enough, or if they're a Republican, worried about another Republican running against them because they're not conservative enough, which pushes the debates over to the edges and hollows out the middle. The other thing we've had is that media has fragmented as well. You know, when I grew up in rural Minnesota, we, all, we only got one TV station. NBC was the only station we had. Most of the rest of the country had ABC and CBS, but all three networks were largely the same. Today, if you look at it, the conservatives are watching CNN, which the conservatives, uh, excuse me, the liberals are watching CNN, which the conservatives sometimes referred to as Clinton News Network, uh, and NPR, MSNBC, the New York Times. But if you look over here in the conservative side where Fox News is the predominant outlet, you don't see any of those same outlets. There's no overlap in what they're listening to. They're listening to two completely different narratives. And although we advise in our school that the best thing you could do is to listen to both sides and try to really uh, find the path towards a common ground, that doesn't happen in the media. The other thing we've had is the rise of activism. You have a little bit of activism here in Japan, but we're well down the road of having a whole bunch of groups in any given issue actively engaged in the debate. And what I tell folks is, you know, they complain about the special interest. If whatever organization you're committing, contributing money to, uh, whether it be the Sierra Club or anything else, if when they say the world is not paying enough attention to anything other than how we must accommodate the views of others if we are going to get anything done, if it's anything other than that, it's a special interest. Uh, special interests are always good in the first person, my special interests. They're always bad in the third person, your special interests. But we have a lot of special interests that are really making the debate more harsh because they listen only to the voices of their contributors, and then they shout those voices very loud on any particular issue. And that's making it harder, because if an um, elected official even thinks about wavering from the party line or what they want to do, they're going to be out there in the streets marching and making life very difficult for them. So they're really pushing their own party further to the edges than they were before. The other thing we have is we have this belief that there's sacrifice-free solutions. It's a myth. We used to think that we would just do win-win. Or did my... We would just do win-win. We would just do win-win where everybody was happy, 
Uh, but in reality, there's very little common ground as you've just seen. And when it comes to win-win, the way we used to do win-win is that it cost money. The Democrats got more spending, the Republicans got more tax cuts, but you just had more and more debt. When you run out of debt, you really can't do that anymore. So as Ben Franklin said, there are no gains without pains, and that's the truth of most of the big solutions we have today, whether it be immigration, the debt, or anything else. The other myth is that good policy is good politics. What's the right thing to do is almost always unpopular. You look at, again, I told you that there's this tug of war and everything, and most of the time, the members are worried about their own primary. In that setting, when you're dealing with the debt, it makes political sense, but not policy sense, for the Democrats to say, we don't need to cut the spending on seniors, we just need to raise taxes. Similarly, the Republicans will say, we, don't, we just need to cut spending this much. We don't need to raise taxes, and what happens? Nothing happens, and so you just put more and more debt on the back of our children to the point where you really can't put any more debt on. Same thing with immigration. We like to think that uh, immigration, good immigration policy is not good politics. When you split the Democrats between being business conservatives, split the Republicans between the business conservatives, 72% of them believe that immigration strengthens our country. But the staunch conservatives, which is the other half of conservatives in America, 81% of those think that it threatens the very fabric of our country. So the one issue that divides Republicans is immigration. That is a gift for Democrats. The last people in the world that would want to politically solve immigration is Democrats because it divides their opposition. So when Obama and Democrats had complete control of both sections and had 60 votes in the Senate and had the presidency, they didn't act on immigration because it's not good politics for them to act on immigration. The only people it's good politics for is to get this off the table as Republicans, but when they're in districts where it's generally more whiter districts, the, the Republican districts, and they have this division, it's also very difficult for them to solve it. We also have this habit over the last several decades of running against Washington. If you look, back in the 60s, Americans trusted their government. 80% of the people trust the government. And then two things largely broke that. Number one, we had Johnson going into Vietnam, which ended up getting mired down into uh, morass and then ultimately what many would view as a, certainly not a victory which brought down, and then we had Nixon and Watergate. And so the trust in government went from 80% down to 20%. It bounced up a little bit during Reagan and during the early part of the Bush administration after 9-11, but now it's gone down, not just in the second term of uh, President uh, George W. Bush, but even further down with Obama. So you have, for the last several decades, if you are running for Congress or running for Senate in Washington, you're running against Washington. Washington's broken, your message will be. I'm going to go to Washington and fix Washington. And generally that means you're, if you're a conservative, you're telling the conservatives that we're going to go and get conservative things passed. And if you're a liberal, the opposite. And nobody's telling them what they really be, need to be told is we're a divided country. The only way we're going to get things done if we accommodate the other side. And so after nothing getting done, nobody's fixed Washington, even though that's what they've been running on for the last several decades. The people have been getting even more virulent and saying, you got to do something, you got to push harder. Rather than accommodate, they're saying you have to push harder. And they've been pushing people to do this filibusters. Uh, witness uh, Cruz and others shutting down the government, which is what their side were pushing for. So I keep pushing the wrong button here which blacks me out. Um, it's great to have my trusted aide here. Perfect, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, we've gone from, in the 1940s through the 1980s, 
uh, almost no filibusters to these filibusters, these 60 vote margins that were talked about, uh, basically grinding down progress in Congress. So all of that together shows you why not much is getting done in Washington, making people very concerned about their government. Then we have economic angst. And the economic angst is a result of, as you can see, this is sort of the distribution by quadrants of income. You can see that that top 1% has been doing pretty well. Those that are real tech savvy folks in Silicon Valley and the investors and those that support them. But other than that, the, the many of the others feel as if they're falling behind. And if you look at the feeling as they're falling behind, there's 43% of the middle class that feels as if they're falling behind as opposed to staying even. Almost none of them think they're getting ahead. And when you look at the, at the lower class, there's a really a feeling of falling behind. So this is the number one issue that's on the minds of the voters that are propelling uh, both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. The other thing beyond this economic angst is that they are both feeling a loss of standing for America in the world as well as feeling insecure. One half of the people in America think the US plays a less powerful role, leadership, global leadership role than it did 10 years ago. But even worse than that for them is there's a long list of things that are going wrong in the world. Now, uh, a conservative would say that uh, President Obama has had America pulling back from the world to a large degree and that fires are burning even more since we've done that. The liberal sides would dispute that view, but when you have ISIS, cyber attacks, global economic instability, Iran, infectious disease, North Korea, refugees, uh, the climate change, China and Russia, there's a long list of things to worry about. Most interestingly, when you ask them, do they think the US government is doing a good job of reducing the threat of terrorism? If you remember, I mean, why Obama rode to, rode to power was because they were not feeling well about it back then. We're now at new highs. They're feeling less well about how good the government's doing addressing terrorism than they were at the end of the Bush administration. So there's a very big concern that we're just not doing a good enough job. There's a huge number of people now believing that we need to increase defense spending, the highest level since the month after 9-11. But you ought not to mistake that, as we'll discuss later, that we ought to be engaged in the world, but certainly there's a view that we ought to be increasing defense spending. So as a result, this is the picture of Washington. They have economic angst, they're feeling insecure, there's political inaction, they got their suitcases, they want to be going somewhere, but because we have our anchors down in both directions, nothing's happening. That is why America is not feeling so great. Enter Donald Trump, selling his story, his solution to this issue. Why has he been able to make the sale with the Republicans? The first thing is focus. And if you want to know where power and politics come from, it begins by coming with a focus. Too often those that don't succeed in politics put too much stuff in their cart that they're talking about. When I was an undergrad, I studied a book called The Economic Theory of Democracy that said that on every issue, there's one issue voters on both sides. If you say you're for tax cuts, there's one issue voters for you and one issue voters against you. And since people more likely will vote to protect something as opposed to get something new, there's usually more one issue voters against you. His book mathematically proved if you, if you take firm positions on more than five, six, or seven issues, you can't win, which is why you're always finding politicians avoiding taking firm positions. You look at Obama. Whatever you think about Obama as a president, that first campaign was phenomenal because it was focused on hope and change. And so that's what propelled him to success. They used to have Fortune magazine do a ranking of the most powerful political organizations in Washington. And always at the top were two organizations, uh, what we call APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, that only focuses on one thing, support for Israel. They may care about 100 things, but they only focus on one thing. And the other organization is the National Rifle Association, the NRA, 
because they're very focused. That makes them powerful. If you look at both Trump and Bernie Sanders, they're very focused and it's really, you could, I could even narrow this list down shorter than this, but wall, Muslim, terrific. You know, it's just going to be terrific when I'm there. Uh, is, captures almost everything that Trump says. And Bernie would be billionaires, Wall Street, and income inequality, which are really all one of the same theme. So their power has come from focus. The second thing is what issues they selected. Economic angst is the number one issue facing the voters today. And it's really driven mostly by technology and also by globalization. But I would say three-fourths technology changes sweeping through the economy and one-fourth globalization. But you can't vote against technology and globalization. You can vote against immigration and trade. And so Trump has capitalized the word wall to imply, I'm going to keep the immigration from coming over because we're going to put up a wall. I'm going to keep that trade that you don't like, blaming it on China trade uh, for the jobs and the lack of income growth. Uh, and so that's the one thing he's done. He's not likely to engage. He talks about, you know, putting ice, you know, uh, bombing ISIS out of ex to extinction. He's not likely to engage. Uh, he is probably as hesitant to engage as Obama or more so. And so the only thing he can do to make Americans feel safe, if he's going to convince them that he's not going to let these radical Islamic terrorists come to America, which is why he talks about the Muslims in the way he does. Interestingly, if you go to his website right now, there's only seven issues listed there. The only one that is a foreign policy is US-China uh, trade reform. He doesn't list ISIS. He doesn't list, you know, increasing the, uh, increasing the military spending or many other things. So he's also focused on attribute selection. He knows that people are upset that things aren't getting done. So he's focusing on clearing out the drains. They clearly be plugged, clogged there in Washington getting things done. I'm a successful businessman. I've done all these businesses. I can get things done in Washington. So he's very focused on issues. He's very focused on the attribute that he wants you to support him for. Social media, he has used social media to drive the mainstream media. There's a lot of people that would complain that mainstream media made Trump. That's not true. We do a lot of research in terms of messages in both social media and mainstream. And one of the things you'll find is this light blue is social media mentions. The heavy blue is the more traditional TV and news. And as you can see, every other candidate, the mainstream media is paying more attention to than the social media is. But because Trump is just dominating social media, he is forcing the mainstream media to be paying attention to him. And there's probably no heavier Twitter users than the mainstream media themselves because they want to stay up on what's the latest news. He's used that to drive mainstream media. He's also driven messages. So if you really want to control the tempo, he wakes up every morning and he wants to be the shiny object that everybody's paying attention to. He'll come up with some outrageous thing to say today that's going to capture the attention of media. And uh, then he'll come up with something else tomorrow. And if they thought yesterday was outrageous, the next thing he says has them forgetting about the last outrageous thing he said. If you look at the Twitter users, they mention his name during the high season of the primary season almost as much as all the other Republican and Democratic people combined. So he's done a very effective job of using media. The other thing he's done a wonderful job of is in timing. If you look at, he knew his primary Republican opponent might be Jeb Bush. And this is an example of the days before you announce your announcement and your after announcement impact. He decided to announce per, for president the day after Jeb Bush. So Jeb Bush got no bounce after he announced, because the day after he announced, 
Trump denounced, and then just kept the message going every day thereafter so that there was really no time or open space for Jeb Bush or other candidates to establish themselves. Another thing he did is if you really go through and listen to what the Pope said when he was in Mexico, he really wasn't saying bad things about Trump, but Trump chose to say he was and basically attacked the Pope. But when did he attack the Pope? He attacked the Pope the day before the South Carolina primary. Our primary season is Iowa, New Hampshire, but the real dividing is South Carolina. South Carolina is in the heart of the Bible Belt that generally isn't that hap big. They're not big fans of the Pope. So when you attack the Pope the day before South Carolina, that helps you in the important South Carolina primary. Right after that, he backed away from what he said because he knew he was going to the Northeast, which has a lot of Catholic voters. But it was unbelievable timing of when he chose to go after the Pope. The also thing that we're having to look at, though, is that will what worked in the primary work in the general? You need different tools for the primary and the general. Uh, you can't take a surfboard to get to the beach or a skateboard to ride in the wave. You need to have both. And what we're finding is that Twitter, which has been a primary tool of Trump in the primary season, is a very negative, get everybody agitated, broad-based medium. Microsoft came out with an artificial intelligent personality called Jay's Tay Tweets. And they had it tweeting, interacting with people on the internet. They had to shut it down after just 16 hours because it was echoing back very racist and sexist things. And so Twitter in and of itself is very negative. He tried to use it in more of a general election mode here recently when he tweeted, uh, on Cinco de Mayo, which is the 5th of May, which is a big celebration for the Hispanics uh, about his taco bowls at the Trump Tower. And what the New York Times said, rather than being greeted as an honest attempt to reach out to a voting group that overwhelmingly dislikes him, the taco bowl post was widely mocked as an obvious ham-fisted pander. So normally what you have to do in the general is if you're going to go after the Hispanics, you need to have a targeted communication with Hispanics. If you're going to go after any other group, you need to have targeted rifle shot communications with those. That type of communication, Obama did phenomenal in his first two campaigns. The Republican Party has been working hard to get those capabilities, but unless Trump sort of has the way he talks in his collaboration with the party tight enough to take advantage of that, it could be difficult for him. The other thing about doing a broad-based communication during a general election campaign is that it may energize your supporter, but it also energizes the opposition as well. And so we don't know yet whether Trump will be able to pivot in the communication style necessary to win in the general. So what happens if Trump wins? How are we going to maintain the harmony that we have today? This is the big challenge before us. I want to tell you a couple of things that will perhaps make you feel less worried, but then leave you a little worried at the end. A couple of restraints that will keep him from going too far is, first of all, the election. Hillary has already put them on notice of saying she's going to be pushing and poking at him on foreign policy issues. That's going to, one would think, over the course of a general election, force him to come to terms with some of these issues that he's been saying that has been so egregious and perhaps be pushed into being uh, committal in a way that's less egregious than he has been up to date in the primary season. The second thing is that we have, as they say, the president disposes, pre -presid the president proposes, Congress disposes. So the president is not a king in our system. When we created our system of government, they deliberately made it hard. They came up with divisions of, of responsibilities and checks and balances. Three branches that are each checking each other, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And within the legislative branch, we made it even harder by having two houses that you have to get both of them to go to. 
Uh, and then thirdly, we've split it between the federal and the state. If you look at the national seal of the US, the only thing it says is e pluribus unum, out of many one. And the government has designed that unless you try to get multiple parties pushing together in something, it won't work. Uh, you've already seen Speaker Ryan, who is more likely to be speaker, saying that he's not really comfortable with a lot of the stuff that Trump is saying. And if the Democrats happen to control the Senate, that's going to make it even harder for him to get his way. The only fuel that runs the engine of American politics is what the original manufacturers prescribed, and that is e pluribus unum, out of many one. You also have bureaucratic inertia. Your bureaucrats are far more powerful than ours. Your ministries are more powerful than ours, but our ministries still have power. They generally are all Democrats, and they generally, if they get somebody doing something they don't like, they're going to follow the book for sure, and they may just wait out the candidate until they get somebody else that they like better. We also have global obligations. Trump may not want to think about this, but there's a variety of obligations like the trade obligations we have under the World Trade Center, uh, World, World Trade Organization that we have to abide by. So what happens depends on which face Trump brings. Is he going to bring of his art of the deal? You know, he said that everything he said is just a suggestion. Is he going to sit down and force the Republicans and Democrats to come together and actually get stuff done? If that happens to be the case, it could end up being many, very good in many ways. Or he could just be the bombastic, you know, poke people, poke people in the eye Trump that we've seen of late. We don't know. The other challenge, though, we have, if you look on the foreign policy side, America gives a high degree of latitude towards the president on foreign policy. One of the things he's been talking about is pulling back globally. Six out of 10 Americans agreed with the statement that US should deal with our own problems, let others deal with theirs as best they can. So when he says to NATO and European allies, you're not paying your freight, and criticizing NATO, only five of the 28 NATO countries are investing in their own military the level that they were required to under NATO uh, agreement. And so you can expect him to go significantly after NATO and have good standing to do that. Uh, when it comes to Japan, I know he's criticized Japan in a similar way, but I think when the facts are revealed that you're paying for a higher percentage of our military forces here in America than any other of our allies. So you need to do a good job of explaining that. And actually the push that Shinzo Abe has been doing to have Japan have an ability to be a more meaningful and supportive uh, ally of America is in line with the direction that Trump is pushing towards. So if you hire a couple of graduate school political management people to help you frame it in the right way, I would hope that we could, uh, we could uh, convince uh, Trump that uh, he ought to be thinking good things about Japan. On trade, I'm much less optimistic. He could pick a fight with China or Mexico. When he says he's going to make Mexico pay for the wall, that means he's going to put a tariff, which means that the American consumers are going to pay for the wall. I don't know how he does it under our North American Free Trade Agreement, but could that start a trade war with Mexico? I don't know. Even Romney in the last presidential election talked about declaring China a currency manipulator day one. Does that give them power to impose tariffs? And would President Xi uh, be understanding if he did? I don't know. So if you want to talk about worries, would there be trade conflicts coming right out of the chute in a Trump administration with either of those two countries? And he's been critical of Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which is the first priority between our two countries. Does he, is he looking to just make a few changes and declare it a victory? If he's really concerned about China trade, this is the answer to calling China to a higher plat plateau, uh, but it's really uncertain on that. Similarly, if you're looking on trade in polling, America has turned towards a majority, uh, a plurality of them thinking that it causes bad things, lower wages and cost jobs as opposed to creating new markets. Concerning to me is that there's more Republicans on that side than Democrats, 
Democrats typically don't help you because the trade unions, when it comes to voting on these issues in the Congress, make it very difficult for Democrats to vote yes. So you're almost always relying on Republican votes on these issues. And those Republicans that are supporting, uh, that are supporting Trump are even more virulently anti-trade. So there are reasons to worry. My view when you talk about business is that unless business folks focuses on these macroeconomic issues, that people aren't feeling as if the benefits of trade and globalization and technology are being evenly distributed, the result is if you ignore the macroeconomic issues is that you get macro political issues. You get both party candidates opposing trade to Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is one of your top priorities. Businesses, in my mind, need to do a better job of engaging with governments and NGOs to make sure that particularly those mid-career people that are feeling left behind get the kind of training they need that they can continue to keep their careers moving forward. And they need to do a better job of selling the benefits of trade. I don't wake up many mornings and look on the TV and have somebody telling me something good about trade. They need to be doing that message if they're going to combat. So I'm just here to tell you that there's a whole lot of things we're juggling. A lot of issues that's going to make it very difficult for us. I don't know the answers to all of those. The one thing I do know the answer to is that Trump will not make America great again. Because America was, is, and will be great, not based on anything Trump is doing. But as de Tocqueville, the Frenchman, said, it's great when America is good and when we cease to be good, America will cease to be great. But I hope that you would agree with me that the many good things that uh, Americans and Japan have done together give us cause to feel great. But we need to get past this next election. And if Trump is the victor, make sure that those of us in this room, Japan and American citizens, are working closely together to keep that very strong bond of friendship we have. Thank you so much. Interesting to have a Ford and a Kennedy up here. Oh, so, uh, and, and apparently we're both presidents. I guess. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark. A pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to Globus this evening. Mark, what is great? We hear uh, candidates saying we want to make America great again. Other people say, well, America is already great. To our audience of Japanese people here this evening, what is this great thing that people talk about? Well, it is true that Americans think that we're a special country, and it drives a lot of other people nuts when we do. But uh, we think that we have a unique role in the world. And as we look around the map of the world, much of the world we have sent soldiers to to fight. And we didn't have to do it for conquest. We turned around and went right home. And so we take great pride when we look at a Germany, when we look at a, at a, at a Japan. We're less prideful when we look at Iraq right now. But we're still hopeful for the future. So I think the fact that the, what troubles people like me is a lot of why we think America is great is because we've helped so much of the world. And now we have a presidential candidates in the form of both uh, Trump as well as Bernie Sanders that are saying, we need to focus more on ourselves. Now, growing up, that's in the Christian tradition, selfish doesn't necessarily make you great. And so it's created a lot of the angst. But I, I think America is great when it does good for others, not just itself. Thomas Sowell, a well-known economist and uh, columnist, a week ago, we must frankly face the fact that the front runners in both political parties represent a new low, a time of domestic polarization and unprecedented nuclear dangers internationally. This year's general election will offer a choice between a totally corrupt liar and an utterly irresponsible egomaniac. A man with runaway egomania may not have the finesse or depth to steer through troubled international waters, nuclear Iran, nuclear North Korea. This is something that comes up a lot. Uh, Trump's fingers on the button, can we trust him? Um, 
How relevant is this question? Well, it is relevant. And let me first of all say that these two candidates, Trump and Clinton, have the most highest negatives of any candidate ever at this stage of a campaign. So perhaps the number one candidate is none of the above, you know, most popular candidate right now. So it's, it's very concerning that we have two candidates we're really not happy with. But our form of government gives the president a high degree of autonomy on foreign policy. Uh, look at ISIS right now. They, during the Vietnam, passed a, a resolution, the Tonkin War resolution, that said you had to get congressional approval within 60 days. How long have we been with soldiers now fighting in ISIS? It's been a long time, years. And Congress hasn't authorized it. That's an example of where the president can put troops on the ground, can start a conflict all by themselves. And forget about you know, the pushing the button. I don't, think we're, I don't think anybody's ever thinking about pushing any buttons from a nuclear war ever again. But you could, uh, let me give you something crazy, land an American jet on that runway that the Chinese are building in the middle of the South China Sea. How would that go over? A president could do that all by themselves if they wanted to. And so it's something short of pushing the button that could cause friction and conflict that's unnecessary. So there is a reason to think about uh, whether the presidential candidate in the US, the president has the kind of disposition to act in a responsible way. It's interesting because you know, Thomas Sowell is you know, a well-known conservative and maybe considered as being part of the conservative elite. And when I read his article uh, last week, it almost suggested that he would be willing to vote for Hillary Clinton, which is unthinkable. Can you tell us more about the Republican elite? Who exactly are these people? To what extent do they have influence? Um, Clearly not a, not a lot of influence if, if we have Trump as the nominee. Yeah. I would say if you go through Washington and you talk to the quote unquote Republican establishment, Republican elite, you would go far and wide before you found anybody that is even remotely happy with Donald Trump. You have a number of elected officials that have come out and said they're for Donald Trump. Why? Because they're up for re-election too. And it, polls show that 85 to 90 percent of the electorate is supportive of Trump, so they can't really run for re-election without having to mount a huge reason why I'm not for Trump and expect to get re-elected. So you've got a lot of the elected officials that are superficially saying they're for Trump, but they're really not for Trump. And then typically what happens in our administration, we have, a, we have more political appointees than you have. So there's a, a cast of, of folks that might be in academia that might come in as a cabinet member or a sub-cabinet member and fill out a Republican administration or a Democratic administration. Almost all of those folks are against Trump and are probably gonna sit out the Trump. And unless they really don't have any other alternative, we'll just wait for the next Republican option. So you will find a lot of the elite, clearly they don't have in this election dominated by the economic angst that they haven't succeeded in giving a successful answer to, that's given them not a lot of credibility with the base. So Republican elite is not really happy about Trump, but their ability to control this election has been shown to be very little. We are in a business school, and I think most of the people here are in an MBA program or recent graduates, and they'd probably be especially interested to understand more about uh, Trump's impact on business. Now, you mentioned uh, his focus points, uh, the wall, Muslims, and being terrific. If we look closely at those, for example, the wall, um, what does he think the problem is and uh, the, the root cause? And why does he think that the wall is the solution? Um, and the reason why I ask that is it's, I think it's insightful to see how that line of reasoning or that way of thinking can tie into business policy. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear what your opinion is on, I have an opinion on, on why there's uh, issues with immigration from an economic perspective. What is he thinking? Well, there's two things. There's the economic perspective. If you look at the, the 
bulk of the middle in America, it hasn't had a real income increase for a decade. Now in reality, they have a lower cost of living because of the cheaper imports from China and India, so they're actually buying more with their dollars, but in terms of what real dollars they have, they, they haven't felt as if they've kept up. So they have many reasons to be upset. And they're saying, they're looking for why is that happening? I mean, a big part of it is we pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China and India, and that's put pressure on the bottom end. Uh, Mexicans is uh, another easy scapegoat in that regard. So it is partly economic angst focused towards the immigrants. But the other thing, other key component of particularly the conservative ethos is law and order. They came here illegally. If citizenship means something, how can we just stand by and not do anything? So there is sort of a law and order element to the anti-immigrant angst that Trump is dying, tying into, not just the uh, not just the economic. But if you look at business, business needs the best and the brightest people moving in and out of their, com of their companies. And a lot of times there's work that you need, even not necessarily the bright technological engineers, but the people just to get the hotels clean, that that immigration is a key source that business needs. So business has reason to be concerned. And I think they even have more reason to be concerned if we start going into a protectionist beggar thy neighbor approach. So do you think that he understands the uh, connection of something like the minimum wage uh, with the fact that there's a high demand for illegal labor in the United States? Or is this simply, he's just unaware of this and he's a reactionary and I need to put up a wall to prevent the tsunami of illegals coming in? Well, the intriguing thing is these anti-politicians are like politicians on steroids. If you look at the minimum wage issue, 85% or so of the American people want an increase in minimum wage. An increase in minimum wage, most economists would tell you, is going to hurt the poor, not help the poor. But at least you're viewing something, viewed as doing something. So I think he's saying he would consider raising the minimum wage largely because of the popularity it is with the base. That's not going to make our economy any stronger. It's going to make our economy weaker. Almost everything that Bernie and Trump are talking about is going to make the economy less strong. Uh, but as I said, good policy is never good politics. Uh, and so uh, getting those things done, because we haven't done the, the difficult things like do regulations that make it hard for small business to succeed. Uh, at the high tax rate, the highest corporate tax rate in the world uh, for industrialized countries. Those types of things aren't politically popular. But if you really want to drive economic growth, those are the things you need to address and solve our debt. Uh, our debt is quite high, and it's providing a, uh, a, a dampening of economic enthusiasm by those willing to invest and take risks. Do you see any lessons uh, for Japan, any parallels with uh, what we're experiencing in the United States vis-a-vis -vis candidates there. Well, I suppose a politician, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, your former politician. There's a notion that a politician is a politician is a politician anywhere in the world. The, the, the motivations and so forth are similar. Um, beyond kind of the, the cliche, um, do you see any deeper kind of insights or lessons that uh, we can learn in Japan from what's going on in the United States and uh, you know what Trump is uh, promulgating well, I'm always hesitant to have an outsider come in here and tell you how to run your country. Uh, so I, I'm always nervous about saying that. But there are a lot of parallels since we're both advanced economies. We have a huge debt that is deterring our folks from investing and moving forward. Your debt is bigger. And uh, it's always easier to just say, let's push off this tax increase and do a fiscal stimulus. But that's going to make it harder down the road. If you look at just debt to GDP, yes, a lot of it's held internally within Japan, but if I were economist, I would be worrying about that. Our regulatory burden is heavy, but the regulatory constraints, we find that small businesses what drives employment and opportunities. Uh, big business can just hire more lawyers or accountants to deal with it. 
small business can't, but small business would provide those opportunity uh, for the people coming up. I think you know, the, the critique from UNES is that the third arrow really hasn't been shot of the reform of the economy and that the rigidities in the economy are still largely there. They're unpopular to do. The right things for Japan to do on that third arrow are unpopular. And I don't know, you know, it's hard to sort of get the momentum you feel you can get by with doing those unpopular things. Uh, I'm most worried about Japan as it relates to youth. And uh, I think there's cultural things in terms of whether women feel comfortable that if they go and have a child that their job is going to be there for them and whether they've given the assurances they need that they're still going to have a career. And the old idea of women, 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 econo women economics or however they say that, to help drive the economy. You talk to most Japanese and they'll say it's there, but we're not doing anything about it. So, uh, and that worries me because I consider Japan America's best friend. Uh, how Japan, if you're, if you're our number one ally, how economically vibrant you are, how strong your overall uh, culture and country is based on the, the population not declining, but keeping stable, those are worries to us. So uh, I could go on forever, but I've already said more than I should as an outsider about what Japan ought to do and just take it all as being heartfelt and wanting a Japan to be stronger uh, in the future. Along those lines in your monitoring of, of uh, Trump's uh, statements and so forth, has he said uh, anything particular with respect to Japan, I, I've, I've caught a couple quotations along the lines of uh, America is losing jobs to Japan. I, I think he's in a bit of a time warp. Uh, maybe he's 40 years out of whack on, on that one. But any more uh, recent comments or? Well, you know, the intriguing insights? thing is if you listen to his debates, and yes, I mean, if you, does, does Trump really know the difference between China and Japan? I'm, I'm, I sometimes wonder. But you ought to take it as a compliment because he keeps saying the Japanese and the Chinese are smart and they're winning and that we Americans are dumb and we're losing and that when we do it, we're going to win again. So uh, he's been complimenting Japan quite a bit if you pay attention to the debates. But I think he's implying that whatever we negotiate in this Trans-Pacific Partnership, that Japan somehow got a better deal than we got. But if you get a dozen big countries in a room to try to negotiate a deal, everybody's got to give a little. Everybody's got to get a little. It's always hard to say whether you could have with that many different countries, all of which have very significant political constraints back home, gotten anything better. Uh, which is why I don't know whether he really just wants to reopen it, move the you know, this issue and say, well, I got him to agree to this more than they were before and we can move forward or whether the Economist uh, magazine recently wrote an article that said based on his upbringing, they thought that he was, he was truly protectionist, not just opportunistically protectionist. And that's my big worry. Um, with regard to TPP and other uh, NAFTA and, and other international uh, trade agreements, uh, do you see him as being truly protectionist? He wants to kind of turn the clock back and ring fence the United States, impose tariffs, uh, subsidies, and so forth? Uh, as I said, The Economist believes he is. Right now, it would be popular to do that. The business community, in my mind, in America, I'm not less understanding of Japan, is engaging politically a fraction of what they need to. Whether or not we stay as a trading nation, we're moving forward to continued trade liberalization is amongst the most important things that we get. The profits that all these big companies that are dealing around the world are coming from is because we have a global trading system that is generally benefiting the world as well as them. And yet, how often do you have them even telling their own employees the importance of that trade? Uh, there's a a manufacturer of appliances back in the Midwest that says half of their production at their plant in this rural community is exported. I said, do you ever talk about that to your employees? No, the, the unions don't like you know, trade, so we don't talk about it. Could they be on their paychecks saying when they get their W-2 saying what their income were at the end of the year, you know, half of your salary came from exports? Or when they get halfway through the year, could they have a little party that says, 
and a picnic that says everything we're making from here to the end of the year is exports. Businesses aren't doing that. They're not telling their own employees. They're not telling their communities. They're not telling the general public the benefits of trade and the idea that if we each do what we do best for each other, we're all better off. And that message being vacant is largely where we got into this mess. So I would just say that in my mind, a very inward looking myopic business community not engaging on the issues that are most important to them, not wanting to ruffle anybody's feathers has resulted in the country and the world drifting in a very dangerous direction. That's very interesting because there are a lot of people here who are interested in starting their own business and the entrepreneurs and, and interested in ventures and some people may actually have uh, some SMEs that they're running now. Um, so you're, you're saying that there has to be um, much more engagement or participation beyond uh, simple economic activity of making a better good at a cheaper price. Uh, are you saying they have to get more involved in the political process? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because um, we have this idea of Milton Friedman, the business of business is business, and business ought to just focus on maximizing its profit. You're not maximizing your profits when you let the political environment drift in the direction that it's drifted. Their profits will not be maximized relative to what they could be if we have both major party candidates against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, society in a democracy is requiring business to engage more effectively with societal needs and have a purpose for their business that benefits not just the bottom line, but society. But even at the macro level, they need to be thinking about how is the overall economy of this country and are we making the tough decisions that we need to be to move this country and this, and this world forward. Interesting. As a former congressman, what kind of messages uh, resonated with you or would have resonated with you if uh, a small enterprise owner came up and said, okay, I run a flower shop. I've got three or four employees. I make less than $150,000 a year, and uh, I'm in, you know, Otomo, Iowa, or something like that. Um, what kind of message would they have to deliver to you? What, what should they be thinking of? Because it, it, it's, a, I think, in, in very much a different dimension, different experience to what they're used to. You know, they're used to um, making enough money to pay the rent, to pay the employees, the day-to-day -day activities of running a business, which is really, really tough. And oh, now I have to think about political agendas and messages on top of that. What are the kinds of things do they have to think about? And as a former congressman, um, in what way would you be receptive to those messages? How would they need to convey those messages to you in a way that you could digest them and you could act upon them? I think the small businesses actually do a better job of communicating than the big businesses. And most politicians are much more likely to hear very loudly a small business message. Um, oftentimes, a small business isn't armed with the specific things they want to do. Uh, you know, they want less regulations and less tax is generally what they want. Um, but I, I'm really thinking more at the, at the large business. I would say as a congressman that um, was a big business executive, that I felt that every time that I did something that was right for the economy and, and happened to be uh, beneficial to big businesses, that that was like me doing charity. That was like me writing out a, a contribution to the local church because the big business do almost nothing to advance a positive agenda. If I'm going to do what's right for them, I'm going to get criticized for being in the pocket of big business. And yet, it's the right thing to do. I'm going to get criticized, so I'm doing a charity. But they're just sitting back and doing nothing politically to drive the agenda in a positive direction. And they're willing to accept more regulations than they should because they can just hire more lawyers and accountants. And that, that hurts the little guy that's coming in the forest that you're talking about, but he doesn't, he doesn't really have the weight or the voice, even collectively, to combat that. So I've, I've become very negative on the, the timidity of business on, on issues that are important to the country. Although the, the topic isn't about uh, 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 Hillary, I would be remiss if I didn't you know, bring her up. In the event that 
she comes out on top. Um, what do you think some of the implications are uh, for Japan and uh, Japanese business and trade with the United States and those business aspects? Well, right now, uh, there's a big division within the party because, as I said, almost all the establishment and almost all the traditional things the Republican Party has stood for on the Republican side, Trump is somewhere else. So everybody's focused on the fact that the Republican Party is divided. The Democratic Party is at least as divided. Look at Bernie Sanders winning one primary after another. Look at him having the energy amongst the progressives and the youth. And so Hillary doesn't have that. Let's just say she hobbles through the primary and she ends up getting the nomination. She's going to have a hard time winning unless she can get some degree of that energy that currently uh, Bernie Sanders has. Let's just say that she does that and she succeeds and Trump says another couple of stupid things and she stumbles across into the presidency. She's uh, really not trusted. If you look through the tradition of the hist of the Clintons over their history, they've always done things that have given people a concern. Uh, this whole Clinton Foundation and where they got their money from, and at the same time she was Secretary of, of State to be having huge contributions coming in from countries that perhaps had something before the State Department. All of this combined with Benghazi, combined with the, the email servers, has just greatly made people concerned about her. So if she ends up being our next president, she will come in in a very weak position. With people not trusting her, with their own party divided, and with if she tries to move towards the center in a more centrist way that her husband governed as, she'll be getting more flack from her left than she will from Republicans. So a lot of the business people being very complacent, they're saying, well, should us figure out a way to pivot back in support of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and some of the more reasonable things we want within a year or two? I think that's optimistic. Uh, it's possible she could. The other thing you'll find is that politi politics in America is like women's fashion. They don't like wearing the same thing for too long. So if we've had two Democratic administrations, uh, we typically move to Republican. If we've had two Republican administrations, we move to a Democrat. So if for whatever reason Hillary wins, she's almost a lame duck from the moment she enters because almost everybody will know that America will just be so sick and tired of Democrats that we're almost for sure uh, going to have a, a Republican, which means the next presidential race will start right after she's sworn in, and you'll have Republicans jockeying for positions to try to lead you know, some opposition to what she's doing in order to establish the names for themselves so that they'll be in a run up to 2020. You limit your campaign to so just a few weeks. You know, we, we do ours, you know, writ large. And, and that, so she's still going to have a hard time being a president that you're going to say, wow, I was really, really pleased we had Hillary Clinton. That's not to say that for many people she's going to be less scary than Trump, but I can't really paint a positive rosy picture. I heard Bill Maher a few weeks ago uh, say the only way the Republicans can win is if they lose. Um, in other words, I think it, it's, it's basically uh, what you're saying. It would be kind of a shock to the system, uh, uh, Hillary coming in. That would, I think the Republicans would, would have reached an all-time low in order to have a transformation of themselves for the next election. To the extent I consider myself a Republican and I don't consider Trump a Republican, uh, I would agree with that statement. And so many of the traditional, what you call it, elite establishment, traditional Republicans view that Trump has hijacked the party. Now, if he hijacks the party and win, then we need to sit back and think, uh, okay, what are we going to do with this? If he hijacks the party and loses, we still have a challenge because there's still that energy about the people that supported him. We still have disappointed them. We still have not delivered increased economic activity and, and progress for that middle class. And so uh, there still has to be soul searching amongst the Republican Party in either cases. Uh, and so if he just wins, loses by little, 
you know, then that wing of the, we'll call it the Trump wing of the party, will say, well, we just need to do it a little harder next time. If he loses by a lot, it'll be a lot easier for the traditional wing of the party to reassert their dominance. So this is an interesting time to be watching politics in America. My impression is that when somebody goes through an election campaign, it's an educational process. Uh, people are, uh, are learning rapidly because you know, their ideas are being tested and critiqued in, in the public by some very, very smart people. Um, to what extent do you think that Trump is learning or can actually learn throughout the duration of the campaign from now until election? Or is he, guys just, is he just an, an ideologue who's anchored in and he won't budge? I think he's anything but an ideologue on anything other than perhaps protectionism, which is the good news. Uh, people hope that he really has no firm positions. If you look at what he's done over the course of the last several decades, he's taken every side of every issue. And he recently made a comment that people criticize that whatever he says from here forward is just a suggestion. So that could give you a hope that he really truly is into the art of the deal. If you looked at how he ran this primary, every time somebody thought he was crazy, if you really sat and analyzed it from a political perspective, he was being pretty darn smart. So I think it would be a mistake to think that Trump is not highly intelligent. Uh, so I would think, I would agree with you that it is possible that he could be learning along the way I'm even saying it's possible that if he truly does the art of the deal, that four years from now we could say he's amongst the best presidents we've ever had. I'm saying that's not likely. <laughs> I'm saying the likelihood of him being the worst president we ever had is at least as high. Uh, but this is a very, in business terms, we would call it a high beta candidate, you know, that he could go, he could go either direction. So let's hope that he learns a lot. Let's hope that he truly is in the art of the deal. Let's hope that he ends up pulling sites together and making us all a lot happier than we are feeling right now. Mark, do you have some time for some questions from our sure, audience, please? Absolutely. Yeah. Can we open it up to the floor, please? Sven, can you help us? Yeah. Questions for Mark. With the Republican Party as it is now, and Trump probably going to be going in, why is Ryan sitting back? Everybody says he should be going forward or doing something now, but he seems to have taken that position where he's back. So Ryan is a friend. We're Minnesota and Wisconsin, as you probably know, are right beside each other. We served together. Um, he's a young guy. He's got young kids. Uh, he didn't want to be speaker because he wanted to spend more time with his young kids. He has an opportunity in 2020, in 2024, in 2028, in 2032. And it's, in my mind, smart for him to say, this is about as muddled mess as you're going to get. Why do I want to get into this mud pit? Uh, and let me just give you another hopeful thing, which is why there's only one state that voted for Marco Rubio for Republican primaries. And that was the state of Minnesota. Why? Because we in the state of Minnesota elected a pro wrestler, Governor Ventura, as our governor, Jesse Ventura. And when you think that crazy is the answer and you vote crazy, and you see how bad crazy is, you all of a sudden become more sane again. So they voted for Marco Rubio. So the, way, the main way in my mind there's sort of a poisonous thing going through the veins of politics. If you elect a Trump and he's crazy, you're going to see a much more sane electorate in the future elections. So I'm sure, I'm, I'm not speaking for Ryan, but Ryan's saying he's going to let this feverish period pass. And when they're looking for an intelligent person that takes these issues seriously and that represents what we used to think were the right policies in life that they'll come back to Ryan. So I, I think Ryan is perhaps, um, if not the brightest hope for the future for Republicans, uh, amongst the top handful of hopes. Just patiently waiting. Patiently waiting. And I think it's a good time to be stepping aside. 
I think we had a question up here. Right here. Was did I did I catch your hand right or no? Okay. Who's got the next question? I'm sure there's another question out there. Either that or I'll start asking questions. Uh, thank you very much for the speech today, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, in your presentation, you shared with us that uh, America is great when it is good. America is good. So what are the requirements for uh, America to be good again? And do you think that requirements could be, let's say, ap applied to other countries as well? I mean, uh, to be good or to be great? Well, if you look at, let's just say that we didn't have this feverish populism going on and you say, we have a world to run. A world is a lot easier to run as a unipolar power. Uh, and if you look at over history, the number of violent deaths that happen in the world, much less violent deaths happen when one person's in charge. You know, whatever Iraq and Afghanistan was, it's thousands of people, and we've had a lot more people die in Syria with America doing nothing than whatever happened in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Safest world is unipolar power. We can't have a unipolar power in the world because the rise of the emerging markets means it's a much more diversified place. Uh, the second safest thing is a bipolar system that we had during uh, the Soviets and Americas because uh, although we lost uh, 50,000 people in both Vietnam and Korea, we lost hundreds of thousands, millions. I'm just talking American lives, but t tens of millions when we had a multipolar world. So if we're moving towards multiple people jostling for power in the world, that is about as dangerous of a world as you can have. Everybody likes that because they like to have their voices heard, but more voices, just as I'm showing you all the voices we have in the political system makes the political system grind to a halt. Multiple people thinking that they have a say in running the world gives multiple more reasons for people to be having friction and conflict. So that would mean that if America was truly going to do what it does, needs to do, it has to lead with a lot more nuance than it ever has done in the past. And it needs to engage more effectively with more people in a more collaborative way than it's ever done in the past. Because there really is no country with either the confidence or the willingness to step forward and lead without America. If I believe anything, I believe if America's not leading, bad things will happen. And um, that is uh, what the conservatives see happening in the world today. If you look at just the list of things that could go bump in the night, South China Sea, East China Sea, ISIS, cyber, uh, anything else, we could be having something big that's a defining moment coming in the not too distant future. So America will be good if it finally shakes out of this stupor it's in right now and steps forward in a leadership role when that happens. Long answer to a short question. Other questions? Thank you very much, um, Mr. Kennedy. I uh, would like to ask this question because I am from Iran, and you uh, mentioned about the Iran nuclear and uh, so many issues in Middle East. Historically, uh, I would like to know, uh, uh, since America uh, was uh, a leader uh, globally and leading so many uh, political uh, things around the world, uh, for example, in case of uh, any democratic movements in the Middle East area. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you know about the, like, uh, Mossadegh in Iran, like, 70 years ago, and the very early movements of getting democratic society over there in the Middle East, and the coup d'etat, which uh, Mr. President uh, 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 of the United States mentioned that was supported by the CIA during that time. And we had a lot of things after that. Uh, what do you think about the leadership of the United States behind those continuously issue in the Middle East? How the United States going to lead to make a peaceful uh, 
Trăiți în The Wall. Do we want to advance freedom or do we want to protect America? The realists want to protect America. They want a balance of power. If anybody's too big, they just want to balance power against that. They're doing that not to move freedom anywhere, just to keep people safe. So intriguingly, what you saw, if you, I'm sure you heard Obama's speech at Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima, um, that was the most idealist speech one would ever hear, but it was amongst the most realist acts you will ever see, because it made Japan happier with America and tighter relationship between Japan and America, and that is part of a realist balance vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, the idealist would want to advance freedom. The realist would say, It never really works well. Uh, let's just keep things balanced. So uh, realism on steroids was the, the Bush uh, neocon approach. Even if America reasserts itself more in the world, it's not going to go back to that. It's not even going to go back to realism. A fellow professor at GW wrote a book called Conservative Internationalism. It says we want to be internationalist, but he does what he called the ink block approach. Let's ease uh, democracy out from where it's already established. He would suggest that World War II was cementing democracy within Europe, and the Cold War was easing it out into European Union, but the IDU can leapfrog democracy into some place in the Middle East is delusional. And I think even the most pro-internationalists are not likely to want to be pushing democracy heavily. Uh, but if you wanted to talk about a reason to be concerned, uh, many people think that this Iran uh, nuclear deal was a positive thing. What have we seen happen as a part of that? We've seen an emboldened Iran. And if you weren't concerned uh, when just a day or two ago, Iran decided for the first time and perhaps the foundation of Islam that they're not going to have their participants, their citizens participate in the Hajj, which all Muslims are called to do sometime during their life because it's in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> We could be seeing the budding up of a Iran, Syria, increased friction, increased conflict in the region. And if Iran, Iran, Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia. And if Iran and Saudi Arabia go after each other, it's going to make Syria and Iraq look like a garden party by comparison. So if you're looking for other reasons to be worried, uh, that would be amongst the list that I would worry about. And right now, America's not looking to do anything about it, nor probably would. But that could cause the huge friction. It's going to cause more friction for a country like Japan that's still relying on oil from the region uh, than it is from a country like America that is increasingly becoming energy independent. So you should be more worried about this than I'm worried about this. Sorry to be, I'm going to try to get us in a positive mood by the time we get done by the end of the conversation. But I, I think a long term, we hold out hope for Iran. There's really more democratic roots in Iran than there is in Saudi Arabia. So I've said for some time that we could wake up a decade from now and Iran being our best friend and Saudi being the one we have conflict, Saudi Arabia being the one we have conflict with. So I'm not anti-Iran. I'm hopeful that the Iranian people will guide it in a very positive direction, just like you would, I'm sure. Other questions? Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, Trump. We have seen uh, Trump, the businessman, uh, who has been uh, successful and has become a billionaire. And we have seen the Trump, the politician, who, to use my own words, which I don't know whether they are right or not, he has been using the words that Americans want to hear, depending on where he is campaigning. So I'm wondering, 
uh, whether I'm wondering about Trump, the global leader, if uh, Trump becomes the president of the United States. Uh, my worry is that uh, after he becomes a global leader, will the other leaders in the world trust him really? Because uh, we believe that, I believe that there is a difference between uh, reality and the ideal. What he has been saying has been ideal, and uh, with the time he has been changing what he has been saying so that it can suit the situation. So when Trump becomes the, pres the president of the U.S., who is expected to be a global leader, uh, it may become difficult for him to negotiate with the other global leaders because of lack of trust. Uh, for example, if he comes to Japan, and then this year he says this, then next year he, uh, he sends one of his men to Japan, and then he comes and says a different story based on the situation. Then in, in that case, uh, the issue of trust will arise. How do you see him succeeding as a, a global leader? We know he has been successful as a businessman and as a politician. But as a global leader, how do you see him succeeding? Can you give us your opinion, please? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that we know he, was a, he is a successful businessman. But uh, you know, uh, some people were born on third place third base and think they hit a triple. Uh, so, uh, and there's a lot of his, you know, the Trump University thing going on right now and some of the other things that I think may fray at the edges of how much of a good business person he is. But I, do, I don't know that I've heard much of anything out of Trump saying that he wants to be a global leader. And my guess is that most global incidents would be read from the what is the American people or the base that he cares about in American people say about that. And as you've seen by the polling that I've shown you, most of what his people want him to do is be more isolationist, more protectionist. And so uh, that, I think, is going to be a lens that he's going to be appealing to in everything he does internationally. He, understands he doesn't want bad media over here. So he's going to be balancing the media and how that's going to blow back in America. So I don't think he's just going to be really pig-headed about it. But I don't think high on his list is being viewed as a global leader. Uh, and so uh, we don't know. Again, you've said he might be a smart learner. He might pick up on a lot of the stuff. He might pivot and adjust and end up being a great world global leader. But he is not, has he said much to you in this campaign that you viewed as positive? I don't think that he's really putting out that many messages to the world saying, I'm gonna be your best friend. By contrast, during Obama's campaign, he was saying a lot of stuff to the rest of the world in his first elections, right after his election was doing international travel it wouldn't surprise me if the first place that uh, Trump went after his election was Cleveland, Ohio, or Toledo, and talked about how these people have been hurt by our engagement with the world. So I, I'm not here to make you feel more comfortable about his global leadership capabilities. We have a question over here. In your presentation, you mentioned about TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we can clearly see that President Obama really pushed for it during his term, uh, but Trump is really against it. So um, in case Trump wins, that means uh, TPP fails. Um, how will it affect uh, the U.S. Um, future position in the global market? I, I think that TPP is the most important issue for U.S. Forget about what it means for Japan. I think it means a lot for Japan. I would recommend you to be highly enthusiastic about TPP. But ultimately, I don't think geopolitically there's anything more important for us to move forward than TPP. Uh, I'm going to give you one sliver of a hopeful idea. The Even if Trump wins, uh, even if there's changes in the Congress, 
we have these things called the lame duck. And we have a president that's for it, Obama, and a Congress that has already voted for trade promotion authority. If they see bad stuff coming down the way, they might be willing to run through TPP in a lame duck. I think that's a single digit odds, but I'm hoping to give you some hopeful things to be taking away and feeling good about when you leave here today. And that would be one of them. Again, I think there'd be a shock, a wake up call for businesses that they need to do the more effective engagement that we're talking to because I, the, the only other alternative to TPP in my mind, which could happen and perhaps could even happen under a Trump administration, is to engage China in it from the start and to say, okay, we're gonna set this aside, this was a good template. Most of the Chinese will tell you, well, the bar is set so high, we could have never come in, and that it's, being, it's setting up more conflict in the future if you're really keeping China on the outs. But one pivot and adjust it could go that you may be less happy about is that we're gonna reshuffle the deck and look at the best deal we can get with China in it from the start. That would be one other alternative that might happen if TPP just dies in the vine. Mark, it's a generally much harder to get out of legislation than to get into one. So for example, uh, we talked about TPP. The other thing is he's going on about repealing, quote, repealing, unquote, Obamacare. How difficult is that to actually accomplish? I think that well, even, it's gonna be hard. I mean, uh, you can repeal it, but there are elements of it that are popular, and you really need to repeal and replace. Republicans, their favorite thing to do is not to talk about health care. They really don't spend a lot of time, it's just not, we, defense, you know, trade, tax cuts, we can talk all day about them. Education, health care, there's less sort of holistic solutions. There's, there's targeted solutions that they would put forward. So I think the replace it is perhaps going to end up being more bluster than reality. But if you think, if he's going to pick a fight with Mexico, we already have a North American free trade agreement with Mexico that doesn't allow anything he's talking about. So I think your question would also relate to that. Can he really renege on North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and can he do that by himself? I don't think so. Can he get Congress to regulate on it? I don't think so either, because I think people would just see that as going down a rat hole. So it, it is true that you're gonna have a hard time unwinding anything or moving anything forward, unless he comes with the art of the deal Trump, willing to negotiate, willing to bring all sides together and get him to do those deals that he negotiated when he was uh, a real estate uh, baron, uh, wheeling and dealing. I can go on without Thank you. Uh, my name is Yusuke Toguchi. I work for JAXA. And um, I thought it was very interesting how you mentioned that to have the U.S. become great again and to make maybe the world better is to have the U.S. become one big uh, leader in the world again. And personally, um, I don't see that as a, I, I don't, personally, I don't see that as a solution because, um, well, historically and maybe even religiously, there's lots of conflict that the U.S. brought, like, to the Middle East, USSR, I mean, Russia, and uh, even though that may be the um, realistic solution, emotionally, I think in those parts of the world, they won't accept the fact that to have the U.S. as leading them. And, um, and on the other hand, um, if there was gonna be a leader, such a leader in this world, I only see the U.S. to be that kind of a leader. But, and uh, my opinion is, is that um, as a Japanese and someone who wants Japan to be great and a leader in the world, I see great, um, personally, I see great potential for Japan to, be, to bring all these different countries that have conflicts together to um, have a, some common ground to work on together. Because uh, historically and religiously, 
Japan, um, well, maybe not with China and Korea too much, but um, Japan is very, has a very neutral stance in the world. Um, not much uh, political or religious conflict with the Middle East. Uh, and I see that um, um, I, I grew up in the States and I thought I had the, I shared the very uh, same feeling that US was, the US was great. And uh, I also felt that when I came back to Japan, I thought it was much better than Japan, but that's not what I feel right now. And I was very surprised when I traveled around the world and um, I found out that there are lots of people who actually really hate the US. I don't know where they're coming from, but um, it was the first time I experienced that because I thought the US was great. And, um, but I never heard that about Japan. There, I, I, never, I haven't met many people who said that they hate Japan or they have bad feelings toward Japan. Although I don't see a political leader that will bring Japan to such a standard to become a leader and bring these conflicting countries together, but um, personally, I think that is that this country has a big potential to do that. I was just wondering if I could have your opinion on this idea. Well, there's two or three things there. And when I talked about America, the type of leadership it would need, I said it would have to be high, hardly much more collaborative, much more participative, much more listening than it's ever done in the past. You're not going to be leading in the sense of a unipolar power, as some people have viewed America has been. But if you're going to prod all these different people to move in one direction as opposed to just bicker and complain about which direction they ought to be going in. You need somebody to prod and push and move them in that direction. Uh, I'm happy you think Japan can play leadership in the world, world in the world, and I hope all Japanese people do because America views that whatever leadership role you've been playing, we would like you to be playing even more of a leadership role. America can't be carrying all this weight itself. We need Japan to play more of that leadership role that we talked about. But I have found in life that there is a reciprocity. You can have as many friends as you have enemies. If you're not willing to make an enemy, you're never going to be a leader. Uh, because leadership is taking on the tough issues. And having somebody that is violently against you moving in this direction as opposed to that direction. And so when you have Japan generally not having anybody say anything about bad about Japan. It's largely because Japan has never put itself in the middle of things like America repeatedly does and say, this is the direction we need to go. Have this America made a mistake? We've made plenty of mistakes. Are we going to make more mistakes in the future? Absolutely. Winston Churchill said, America always does the right thing after it's exhausted all the alternatives. Uh, and I don't know that we're going to get any smarter moving forward. But again, um, I want, America wants Japan to play more of a leadership role. But that's going to require you taking positions not just internally on your own politics, but externally where there's conflict and you're taking a position on a conflicted situation. And not just those that are in your own interests. You might say we're being brave and bold in these in the the island fights with China, but that's specifically Japan's interests. And you're not great just by focusing only on yourself. You're only great when you're able to take difficult, controversial positions on things that aren't 100% directly just beneficial to you. I'm giving a lot of tough love conversation. I feel like I'm. Uh, being overly negative and overly, uh, overly something. I'm going to try to find a positive thing to lead us out of here on the end at the end. But can we talk baseball? <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Well, I have not been following Trump too much, but there are a few uh, comments which I heard in the newspaper. That one was that he said that they need India to fend off unstable Pakistan. And he also said that now South Korea has to fend themselves. So do you think that these type of comments by him are going to fuel the anti-American sentiments? And what are the implications also of such comments on the Asian politics as well as the business? Asian politics as a? As a and the business. 
as a kind of business? No, Asian politics and the Asian business with America trades and all these things. So um, when you look at the world and you look at the big, so I'm a G20 snob. So this is my ninth visit to Japan. I've been to J China 15 times. I've been to most of the G20 companies, mul countries multiple times because the big players are the ones that are going to be able to solve the big issues. India has got to be part of that. Uh, America largely views India as inching in a more positive direction and addressing some of their economic woes. And I don't think we want to set up a conflict between India and China, but I think India is a player that uh, if it stepped up in a more of a leadership role, just as we're asking Japan to, could help solve many of these issues. I recognize that there's an anti-American slice of India, but generally when I go to India, I find it to still be a very positive response to Americans. One of the things that makes me feel heartened is that if you go right in the very heart of Delhi, they have a big arch that all the streets emanate from, and that arch is a celebration, not a celebration, a monument to all the times that India has stepped forward with America in past conflicts. So we don't, we have a tradition there to build on, and I would be violently against Trump trying to do anything to poke and prod India, anything other than the positive direction that it's been drifting recently. So it can play a very important role, and it needs to also think of itself as stepping up to a higher role. America can't be leading anybody. America needs to be sort of more like the person running for student council than the superintendent in all these situations. But India and Japan are two very important players in the constellation of countries that could guide this, con this, this world in a more positive direction. Questions? We're coming pretty close to the top of the hour. And uh, Mark, I have a question that's not really related to Trump or Hillary at all. I'd be very interested to hear your insight because you, uh, you were a businessman, you are a businessman, you're president-elect of a major university, uh, you serve the country as a congressman. I find myself drawn to old films on YouTube, uh, debates of 30, 40 years ago. And why am I drawn to them? Well, it's a little bit of nostalgia. Um, but I really like the way that people with very different opinions were able to express themselves and exchange ideas. Uh, there was a, a kind of a, a finesse and a genteel way where people with radically different ideas could go on stage and have a conversation. And I don't see that at all today. Um, you've have such a long baseline in business and politics. Um, what's going on? What, what has happened? I mean, I think the fragmentation of media is part of it. And if you say, can we move back in that direction? A part of what I teach our students is the most important thing you need to do. And if you read the book, the first chapter says that I gave a taxi driver a piece of advice that I said that if he followed this advice when he's lying in his deathbed, he would say it was the, one of the 10 best pieces of advice he's ever had. And that was to read both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times editorial pages every day. One is the voice of the intelligent right. One is the voice of the intelligent left. If you're going to be the kind of leader like we used to have in those days of nostalgia, uh, they're going to have to compete in a fragmented media market, meaning they're, need, they're going to need to be able to to communicate through multiple channels in a way that resonates with multiple audience, not just an ABC, CBS, NBC audience. That's harder. Just as it's going to be harder for America to provide leadership in a collaborative, participative way than it was as a unipolar, it's going to be harder for the real kind of leaders that we could all get behind to have the skills to communicate to multiple different audiences. And, and, and that's the number one thing I try to bring forth for our students students at the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington. Just one story about that, then I'll get to North Dakota. Uh, I started an award when I uh, am leaving for one of our students. We already have an award for the smartest, the uh, most thought leadership. 
I started a Frontiers of Freedom Award for those that have helped to expand the frontiers of freedom beyond the borders of America. And I was pleased that the first recipient was a Saudi woman that in her class had done a class project on trying to get more freedom of religion in Egypt. But then she went back home to Saudi when they opened up allowing women to run for office in the local, uh, local uh, uh, councils that they have, that she was the volunteer campaign manager for the, for the youngest woman candidate. And they still have restrictions on what women can do. They can't drive, they can't talk in front of an audience that has men, they can't do all this other stuff, uh, but she was applying it. So I still think that there's a lot of positive things that are happening. I'm going to a new university. We play hockey. We won our eighth national hockey championship. The NCAA forced us to change our name. We used to be the Fighting Sioux. Now we're the Fighting Hawks. And it's huge controversy that I don't want to get into here or back in North Dakota. But I am embracing the idea of the hawk. As if any of you have studied the Arthurian legends of King Arthur, uh, Merlin, the magician, uh, when Arthur was young, converted him to a hawk so that flying up above, he could see that all those invisible lines we've been fighting over, they're not there. And so I'm starting an Eye of the Hawk lecture series where I'm deliberately hoping to bring in people with two different sides of an issue and having us talk it through so that we can all understand both sides of an issue. Um, I came to political consciousness during the time of John F. I came to political consciousness when somebody with my same name was assassinated. I was six years old sitting in our living room watching our black and white TV you don't remember much when you're six, but what I remember was the TV going from one city after another around the world of people that were pouring into the streets in grief over a leader falling, a leader that they considered their own, a leader that they had a high degree of affection for. How, how foreign that sounds today. If we're gonna have those types of leaders again, we're gonna to have to have people that are not only understanding both sides of their own debate within their country, left and right, but the debate of Japan, India, China, Iran, everybody else. And so uh, I'm hoping to what we're doing at George Washington in North Dakota to push and prod more people in that direction. I wanna push and prod you to specifically look at both the left and the right and the international perspective and when more and more people do that and we get leaders that tap into that, I'm hopeful that 30 years from now, they can be looking back on the, our future and thinking of it nostalgically. So that's a wonderful message uh, to people who are attending Japan's largest business school, aspiring future leaders. Uh, the mission of the school is to develop leaders who create and innovate in society, starting with Japan. And that's a very powerful message that you've left us with. And why don't we show our appreciation to Mark for coming all the way from the States to be with us today and deliver his message. Thank you very much, Mark Kennedy. Thanks.